All right. Um, I think we can start now our session of today, which is a, about how to write a policy brief. Uh, let me say good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where we are, because uh, I know we are joining from different parts of the world. Uh, that's the good thing of uh, conducting meetings uh, online. So feel welcome to the workshop series, Communicating Science to Facilitate the uptake of research findings into policy and practice. Uh, I should say that uh, this event is brought to you by the Malawi Liverpool Welcome Program, uh, the FIOCRUZ, the ICDDRB uh, in Bangladesh, and the, uh, the Applying Research to Policy and Practice for Health program at the Global Health Network. And today, uh, uh, I'm your chair. My name is Dr. Konran Chizuisano, and I'm a research fellow and lecturer in the Department of Environmental Health at the Malawi University of Business and Applied Sciences in Malawi. And uh, I'm delighted to, to, to be joined today by our speaker, Dr. Sohan Shafiq, as well as the Global Health Network team. So really feel free to be part of this process, which will be quite exciting. So why are we here to discuss about policy brief? I uh, should say that a stakeholder mapping exercise conducted in March 2020 by the Applying Research to Policy Practice for Health program at the, uh, at, the, at the Global Health Network highlighted the role of science communication as a crucial driver of research uptake. And the different stakeholders within the research uptake cycle, such as researchers, uh, journalists, policy makers, and advocacy organizations, were identified as groups that shape how scientific results are communicated, interpreted, and taken up into policy and practice. Uh, thus, as a result of this, uh, there are three part workshop series that have been set up where we are working in partnership with inspiring experts to present the communicating science to facilitate the uptake of research findings into policy and practice workshop where speakers will share their skills and experiences in communicating scientific information. Uh, the topics this workshop series uh, will cover, uh, part one has already been covered, uh, that was conducted uh, on the 21st of June, it was about how to talk to the public about controversial topics in science uh, which happened. And the, today is just part two of this series. And the, as the, we have already said, it's about how to write a policy brief. And then the, we'll have another important uh, session uh, that will be on the 5th of July. And it will be about how to communicate with the journalists. So we look forward uh, to all of us to make sure that we join as well, because it's quite important to, so to, to, to learn more and to share knowledge on how can we engage journalists with the research that we are conducting. But uh, in today's session, as we have said, we will focus on how to write a policy brief. And the, the main objectives of this workshop are to understand what the policy brief is, including types and relevance, uh, to describe the characteristics of a policy brief, and importantly, to describe the structure and contents uh, of a policy brief. So all these are quite exciting objectives that will be covered uh, by the end of this session, and uh, we hope to have an interactive session indeed. Uh, this session was, uh, will run for two hours. Uh, teaching will be a combination of presentation and the uh, questions and answers. So make sure that uh, we, we use the Q and A uh, chat there if we have any questions that we require clarification as we move on. We can start be lighting the questions as the presentation is going on and even can be done maybe at the end of the presentation. So let's keep on uh, uh, interacting through the chat there, especially the Q and A. Before we begin, we will run through some important information on housekeeping. Uh, firstly, live interpretation is available. Live interpretation is available in French, Spanish, or Portuguese using the language button at the bottom of your screen. 
If you'd like to hear the event in English, make sure you select the English channel. Likewise, if you'd like to hear the event in French, Spanish or Portuguese, make sure you select the appropriate channel. In case you hear both the original audio and the interpreter at the same time, use the mute original audio option. Uh, secondly, this session is being recorded and the, the recording and presentation materials will be shared in the coming days on the Global Health Network, the ARCH site, so you can review materials and share. These materials can be found using the links, the link that's just being shared in the chat box. So just take note of the link where you can access all the information in, in regard to today's session. Uh, to interact with the panel, please, as I've said, use the Q and the A chat function, which you can find in your toolbar. So let's make you make, let's make use make, make use of this uh, chat to light our questions, our areas that require clarification. If you have any technical issues, please let us know in the chat, and the Global Health Network team will aim to assist you. And the, we have dedicated time allocated for Q and A, so we'll try to get through as many questions as possible. So don't hesitate. If you have any questions about how to write a policy brief, to make sure that you put all the questions in the Q and A, and we'll make sure that the session responds to that by the end of it. This workshop series gives you an opportunity to get a certificate. Uh, that, that's the, yeah, another exciting about it. And for one to be eligible for a certificate of attendance, you must attend at least 80% of the workshop and complete the workshop evaluation. Uh, the evaluation form will be sent to you via email after the event, and the, your, your certificate will be automatically emailed to you once you have met these requirements. So it's quite exciting to be part and parcel of this because you get a certificate uh, by the end. So we really encourage you to be part of the team as we move on uh, with the series of the workshop that have been planned. Now, uh, let's move on uh, uh, in terms of uh, the presentation uh, for today. Uh, I would like to introduce to you the speaker of today's session, uh, which is about how to write a policy brief. Uh, the speaker for today is uh, Dr. Sohan Shafiq who is a health policy and systems researcher with specific interest in urban health and nutrition. She obtained her BSc and MSc in nutritional sciences from University of Dakar, Bangladesh, MPH from University of Queensland, Australia, and PhD from University of Toronto, Canada. For the past 15 years, Dr. Shafiq has been actively engaged in designing and implementing community-based cluster randomized trials and mixed method implementation research. She has vast experience in evidence synthesis, uh, knowledge translation, and policy communication. Currently, Dr. Shafi in the Health Systems and Population Studies Division at ICDDRB uh, in Bangladesh. So uh, it's over to you, Dr. Shafiq, uh, for the presentation uh, of today about how to write a policy brief. Well, you're yeah. muted and we can't hear you, Dr. Shafi. Yeah. Sorry about that. And um, thank you, Dr. Titsvitsano. And uh, thank you, Global Health Network, for having me here for this, um, dis discussing this very important uh, um, presentation. Can you see my slides, all of you? Yes. Yeah. OK. All right. can see them. So uh, as we heard that uh, in today, we uh, we are here today actually as part of this initiative of communicating science to facilitate the uptick of research findings into the policy and practice. And today we'll be discussing how to write a policy brief. And um, uh, so today we will uh, we will discuss about how you can plan your policy brief, the template and structure of a policy brief, designing, revising, and using the policy brief. I hope that at the end of the um, session, 
we will be able to get some ideas about how to well, the overall idea about a policy brief and how to design, uh, revise, and how to use your policy briefs. So first, what is a policy brief? I understand that because of your interest and uh, in the research policy uptake, you may have already seen a policy brief and have may, may have already written a policy brief before. So um, again, let's actually look at the, the definition or what is it? Um, it is a key tool to present research and recommendations to a non-specialized audience. As we all know that in the, in the research field, actually we use a lot of jargon and we um, use the method methodological approaches that are not very understandable to the general public, but our policymakers, they come from a very um, people-centric perspective and um, they talk in a language, in a very uh, layman's language. So our policy briefs objective also has to be very um, do targeted to that audience. So it has to be clear and and concise and is a standalone document it, it has to be and that focuses on its single topic uh, the policy brief it's a, it distills the research findings in a plain language and draws clear links to policy initiatives so I, I think actually we can all understand that of course uh, the, to understand to for this policy communication this policy brief is a very important tool so the policy brief is a vehicle for providing advice to convince the target audience of the urgency of the current problem. As we all know that whenever we are doing a research, we do it actually for, for solving some problem. And we need to actually look it in a, in a policy, what is a policy perspective and policy buy-in in that process, and then actually advocate that. So we need to convince the target audience. And also to do that, we need to persuade the target audience to adapt the preferred course of action. So in the policy cycle, there are lots of uh, actions to be taken, and we need to understand those processes. And this policy brief can be a vehicle for this providing this advice in a very organized manner. So uh, I have actually um, taken a lot of ideas from IDRC or CIHR, Canadian Institute of Health Research and International Development uh, uh, Research Center, uh, where there are lots of information available on the knowledge translation. Uh, so uh, if you can go to those websites, I can also share later on of the different. Uh, so you will see some examples of the policy briefs that are available in various websites and where their knowledge translation is a main topic for those organizations. So in a policy, this is what you have looked at um, this, uh, what one policy brief can look like. But of course, there are many ways of presenting a policy brief. So there are main types of two types of policy brief. You can see uh, there is an advocacy brief. In an advocacy brief, you argue a particular course of action. So you already know that actually what should be your recommendation. And that's what actually you take actually from in a course of action, you discuss that in an advocacy brief. Uh, on the other hand, in an objective brief, you provide a balanced information uh, of a specific topic for your policymakers or the audience to and uh, to take the decision. So you provide several policy options that this can be done, and uh, this will be the policy implications, and also share the other uh, other ones. But however, then ultimately it will be actually they will be deciding what is actually most suitable. So as we all know that there are several ways of policy making process and sometimes there are researchers pool and some policy makers, uh, researchers push and policy makers pool and it has to be in integrated way. Uh, a, a ideal policy making uh, situation can be an integrated way. So uh, when do we need a policy brief? So in the policy making cycle, there are several steps of a policy making cycle. For example, for the first step is to review the uh, the situation. So through the report, different reports, evaluation, and some monitoring uh, reports and uh, and uh, situation analysis, we can understand actually what is the current uh, scenario and what is the gap in policy and services. And accordingly, we should take the agenda. 
So after uh, reviewing the liter recent literature through, through different evidence synthesis processes, through a scoping review, so systematic review, or maybe a rapid review uh, during a pandemic situation, we have seen a lot of rapid review being done. So through this, we understand actually what is the seed problem, like what is the need for policy making or what is the gap in policy making, and then we set the agenda. In the agenda, we identify problem, uh, then what needs to be done and set the agenda. And finally, the policy formulation is being done uh, for developing the options and the strategies. And then negotiation as well as formulating the policies all happen in this region, uh, in this area. And then actually for the implementation of those and those policies. This is actually the general policy um, making cycle. So where do we need the policy? It's a very general question actually, is it usually, we understand we think that at the end of the research when we have our research uh, um, findings ready in hand only then we will be actually using this policy brief without dissemination it's actually not like that a research in the entire policy making cycle of course research is at the end it, we have a solid evidence that we'd like to take it to a policymaker but throughout the policy making cycle there is a need for policy brief however the most important area is the agenda setting where you're identifying what is the problem. And then, uh, so mainly the policy brief is most needed at the policy agenda setting um, um, time or period. And then, however, you can also use this policy brief in different um, time points of a policy making cycle. So first you have to plan your policy brief. And uh, so uh, of course, for any, any kind of activity, planning actually gives you the best results, the best outputs. So planning is key uh, for writing a policy brief. So there are some vital elements uh, of an influential policy brief. Uh, I'd like to highlight this word influential policy brief because not all the policy brief would end up having a change in policies. So if you would like to an, in, write an influential policy brief, we need to keep this uh, few points in mind. So first of all, um, of course, the purpose, uh, we need to understand what is the purpose of the uh, writing this policy brief, who is the audience, the content, and as well as the structure of the policy brief. So let me discuss about the purpose of the policy brief. So what is the what is the writing of, uh, the purpose of writing a policy brief? Is it is to inform the readers of a particular issue, and such as possible policy options and make recommendations. We need to be upfront about the purpose from the very start of writing the policy brief, and uh, for doing so. We, we can maintain a focus on the direction and uh, from uh, using a very lucid language, we can main, main mention why we are going. So the readers from the very beginning will understand this is where we're going. So all in each of the sections of your policy brief would be connected to each other and that ultimately would lead you to the policy recommendation. So we need to maintain a focus on your directions and communicate the urgency of the issue. Of course, all of the topics are important, especially uh, we are working in global health and each of the wherever we have uh, dedicated our lifetime in, in one research area or one topic area, we think that because this is important and we need to actually bring that into this policy brief about and the, and uh, write, write with the right words and um, and we should highlight the urgency of this issue and also focus on the benefits and advantage of following your policy advice so you can also mention actually what for example if you uh, if you're working on adolescent health and you can actually do a cost benefit analysis or cost effective and effectiveness analysis and mention what would be the return of this investing in adolescent and um, uh, girls and boys um, and uh, and ultimately how it will be benefited for not only their health outcome but also in the national uh, level um, uh, development outcomes so these are something like this you have to because you have, as i mentioned that we are talking to the policymakers who are, are um, um, who knows about their field and they will be interested how they will be interested we have to remember that very well and um, that will be take take me to the the next points about uh, the audience. But before going uh, there, we can uh, highlight a little bit more about the purpose, about writing the, about how to write that body purpose. So we need to write out the purpose before uh, the drafting a brief to ensure that everything you write serves a purpose. So 
each of the sentences needs to be um, uh, very thoughtful, carefully drafted. I'm going to be focused on the specific problem we are trying to solve. Uh, and sometimes what we do actually in, in, in one research, we have several research object, objectives or we focus on several outcomes. But in a policy brief, you have to think about which of the problems you will be discussing and which of the results or which of the outcomes you'd like to highlight in your policy, in this policy brief. So that's actually one of the key for writing a purpose of your policy brief. And I was, as I was just mentioning, the audience is absolutely important to understand the audience and also who actually you're targeting to. So policy brief should be accessible and targeted to a specific audience. Before you begin writing, we have to establish um, who your perspective, perspective readers are, their interest and the level of knowledge of the subject, the information they will need to make a decision and their openness to your recommendations. So these are some of the things you have to think of when you're deciding about writing the uh, policy briefs and keeping your um, audience in mind. So it's always helpful actually to discuss this with your um, uh, with a friend who are who is not in in public health or maybe discuss completely from um, different. Uh, maybe he or she is actually studying engineering or um, she is working in a field. Um, uh, completely out of, or not related to health, but health is everyone's uh, stake. So everybody's interested in health and everybody knows about uh, different health issues and everybody seeks care when any family member is sick. And also for the audience, for the policymakers, they have to deal with this whenever there is an emergency. Uh, so whenever there is a disaster, they have to think about the health issues and they have to take decisions. So the audience, you have to think about the audience and how actually you have to tailor uh, your um, policy brief to make the, meet the need of that uh, audience. Then the content. Uh, the policy brief should be very clear, succinct, and focus on a single topic. So we need to keep our policy brief a little that's why it's the name is policy brief. Uh, we have to keep it within around 1500 words is quite ideal and about two page in length. Uh, we should avoid uh, overly being overly descriptive about the methodology. We understand the methodology is very important for scientific uh, science writing and communicating science and of also evaluating the methods. But for writing a policy brief, it's it has to be very, uh, the descriptive uh, would, uh, it's not very much needed because it would actually not add much interest for our um, audience, but rather you can mention some of the key methodology, how it was used, um, what was done, and when the person place time and all the key key issues for it uh, for your study, where it was done, when it was done, and what was the method that refers if it was an intervention, what in intervention was given. Very very few um, key methodology you can mention, but not the detail um, how the randomization was done or all this kind of thing, it's, we have to avoid that in writing a policy brief. And uh, while we are drafting uh, this, um, the content, uh, we have to draft a new purpose-driven policy instead of summarizing or cutting down an existing report. So of course we write, we are, for every study when we finish, we have a report, but we need to actually tease out, as I mentioned earlier, that we have to tease out which of the result we'd like to uh, convey, which message we'd like to convey to what audience, and accordingly this purpose-driven policy we need to draft. Uh, and also we need to use plain language all throughout, uh, starting from the very beginning to end, very plain language has to be used. For the structure is another very important aspect of a policy brief. The structure should lead the reader from problem to solution. Uh, so you have we we need to start with the problem uh, to create and also the urgency as I mentioned and then to solution. So uh, the reader would understand about the gaps. So this is actually why it is being done. The rationale uh, in the background. So I will when I'll be discussing about the different uh, uh, content uh, or the the different. Uh, um, uh, sections of the policy brief, then I'll go into more detail. Uh, but we will be discussing at the beginning, we'll, be, we'll start with the problem 
and uh, emphasize on the importance of this problem, why it needs solution, and the urgency of the importance of this uh, problem, and then to the solution, to go to the solution. We need to be clear about your policy recommendations and how they support the with evidence. It's very important that all of the um, in a policy brief, whatever we write, it has to be supported by evidence. It should be audience specific and reflect research audience interest. So uh, audience specific, what we mean by audience specific, I just mentioned that it has to be uh, who is our audience, what level of policymakers we are talking about, for which um, problem, all of this, they have different uh, kind of, for example, for uh, if it is for the health minister, so health minister already probably already has some lots of ideas about health. But if we are targeting a finance minister, if we are targeting even a cabinet ministry where with lots of MPs or many MPs are, are there and we, we are in a meeting with the, with the MPs where we are try, trying to convince some general uh, and uh, for importance of a particular topic, why it's important, why I need to um, think of uh, this pandemic preparedness uh, So and how it could be actually having impact uh, kind of in the non-health area. So, so we, have to, we have to actually discuss and beforehand think of beforehand who is our audience and why we are writing this and what is the message we'd like to convey uh, through this uh, through this structure and reflect this. Um, each of these audience interests has to be put in there. So now we can actually discuss the template of a policy brief. Um, for a template, uh, as we all know, actually how this it is an effective structure. Um, so the key elements of an effective structure of a policy brief uh, are, uh, we start with the executive summary and then we, uh, in, there is an introduction. Uh, Afterwards, we have the overview of the research problem, or usually we call it, it can be a part of the introduction, uh, and then examining, examining the findings and concluding section, and that explain the policy recommendation and implication of that research. In the executive summary, uh, so in every policy, we should open with a short summary. Uh, and this could take the form of a few bullet points or a short paragraph or two. Sometimes it, or it can be the discussion section can uh, be a second paragraph, but usually it's one paragraph. And sometimes it's also presented uh, not as one paragraph or a few bullet points. Regardless of which style you choose, condense uh, the essence of the brief down to a few sentences. So after this always usually you write it at towards the end of your uh, um, for tip an important tip for writing an executive summary is that um, it is um, uh, the executive summary should always appear on the cover of the brief or at the top of the first page so that it is the first thing that reader will see. So we understand the policymakers have very little time and sometimes maybe they would actually only look at the read the evidence summary or executive summary. Um, so we have to be very careful about uh, preparing this. So uh, they probably will not have the time to go through each of your sentences, but maybe they will skim through it, but they will read this executive summary. So we have to be very clear about what is the main message has to come to this executive summary. And it can be helpful to write the executive summary last because you will gain the clarity of its contents as you draft other sections, specifically the recommendation sections of what you want to convey through this policy brief and uh, for your main message. Uh, or your key argument. So uh, the, we start the policy brief uh, with the executive summary, but of course the entire, the, the content should start with the introduction. The introduction should set up the rest of the document and clearly convey your argument. It's just like the introduction section we write for any report or any uh, any uh, um, scientific article, uh, but however, the, it has to be very clear and concise and uh, the main message and the main rationale has to be there describing the problem. The goal is to leave your readers with a clear sense of what your research is about while enticing them to con continue reading. So it's always that they need to turn the page. Your policy base is all about uh, um, uh, attracting your audience and so that they want to read uh, uh, to until the end and reach to your recommendation section. 
Some of the tips for writing introduction is uh, in one or two paragraphs, define why you are writing the brief and express the urgency and importance of the topic to your audience. So uh, of course, this is uh, very important that uh, we had, what we are doing is, uh, is to solve a key particular problem and also do, and of course this is urgency. Why it's urgent? Because it needs some uh, policy attention. And uh, the policy attention means is actually not only to be prioritized, but also some resource should be allocated from the budget, from the financial, some financial allocation should come to this particular topic so that there is the policy are being implemented and ultimately reached to the beneficiaries and there is a change in the, in, in, in the ultimate in the goal of uh, the particular in the particular area. So that's why actually it's in the introduction we have to define why we are writing the rationale of the uh, of our of our problem. And uh, we have to discuss the key questions of your and uh, of your analysis and your conclusion here. So towards the end of the introduction, you have to write the key questions of your analysis. Then the research overview. This is the most important sections of the brief because it explains reasoning be uh, behind your policy recommendations. In effect, uh, this section describes the problem that your policy recommendation in intend to solve. In the research overview, it provides a summary of the facts to describe the issues, the context, the research methods, and focus on two main research approaches, and, and another is the research results. In the research approach, you mentioned that, and we explained how the study was conducted, who conducted it, how the data was collected, and any other relevant background information. Uh, and also the, in the results section, we paint a very general picture of the research finding before moving on to the specific. While we are presenting this result, we have to be very careful that we shouldn't be um, providing very statistical significance or detail in these sections because it is a, it's important for um, writing the, um, our, our results and interpreting the results, of course, but for the policy, our audience, uh, it's not very important. They, rather, they would be, uh, it's will be more impo important for them to interpret the results. So that's actually something we need to be very careful how we are presenting the results uh, using it a very simple bar chart or a line graph or that is very visual and uh, so that the policymaker and our audience can very simply can understand the, the differences or uh, in the two um, uh, main ar argument that we are trying to make or we can also use some pictorial if it is a qualitative study we can actually um, uh, with permission from uh, our um, uh, whoever the photograph has been taken from. So of course we can use this kind of evidence and some um, visual anthropology kind of evidence uh, to catch the attention of our policymaker. So as I mentioned, that is very important, but uh, in the research approach, we have to uh, be careful about it. There is a difference in writing the research approach section in, um, in our uh, scientific articles and in the policy brief. It has very simple and uh, it has to be understandable by our research audience. And then in the discussion and the analysis of the research findings, in this section, we should interpret the data in a way that is accessible and clearly connected to your policy advice. So the goal is to be convincing, but, in, but we have to ensure that the analysis is balanced and defensible. So always it has to be backed by evidence in whatever your research finding is. Uh, sometimes it's a summary of not only one research, uh, it can be a summary of, uh, it can be a policy brief based on a systematic review or a meta-analysis. So you have to clearly describe and then summary what has been found and how um, it is important and what it means. So in the discussion, actually we interpret the results and uh, how actually it uh, it's very important and how it's relevant uh, to the to the specific problems and the most important part, um, I, I under i think the most important section is the conclusion or recommendation where we try to convince the policymaker to take specific action in the in the beginning i mentioned that there are two types of 
policy brief. Uh, so based on that, uh, actually with some advocacy brief and there are some objective briefs. So, uh, and while you are actually developing your policy brief, we have to think that according to your need, what you're, uh, what you're trying to achieve, accordingly you will uh, develop each of your sections including policy recommendations. If it is an advocacy brief, you have to be very clear about this is the one that you would like to uh, advocate, uh, you would like to actually carry it forward and convince the policymaker. If it is an if it is an uh, objective briefs, you actually this, um, share some of the options, and the policymaker can choose the best option uh, that is suitable, that is feasible uh, in in the country country context or in the limited uh, resources that they have. So. Uh, to write the conclusion or recommendation, this is the final section, uh, and it should detail uh, the actions recommendation by the research findings. Uh, this draw the link between the research finding and your recommendations, and we need to use a persuasive language to present our recommendations, but ensure that all the arguments are rooted firmly and clearly in evidence produced by the research or the research that you have summarized. Uh, you want to uh, want your readers to be completely convinced that yours is the best advice. So we have to be uh, here. We have to have. Often it's very important that we discuss with our research group, and uh, if, if if possible, having a small validation workshop with our stakeholder uh, before publishing this policy brief. Uh, and um, whatever we have been recommending here is should be accept acceptable by the policy. Uh, um, uh, our policymakers. So it's always very important that before publishing it, you have discussed with your uh, this um, with the, some experts or the key stakeholder, or uh, um, so that your results, whatever you recommend recommending, it's uh, it's very uh, it's very important. Uh, if the policymaker find this, uh, it's very convincing uh, to them. And uh, in the conclusion and recommendation, we also need to um, highlight the implications uh, and the recommendation produced by this research. Uh, the, for the implications, uh, we mean that there are the, uh, the, the effects of this research that could have in future that describes the potential consequences of this particular policies. If we take this policy, how it's going to benefit um, uh, this uh, adolescent health or women's uh, health or particularly for a specific area, that's how it's going to improve in, in the particular policy. And also follow up the implications with your recommendations. It should act as a call to action by stating the precise, relevant, credible, and feasible next steps. So this is very important. I find this, this is the most important uh, section of the policy brief, as well as uh, how it has to be written. And often in the recommendation should be written in by action words. Uh, but you, if you want to like the few bullet points, few recommendations, you should start with some action words, like some verb words that uh, this has to be done, not uh, like the, or, uh, or um, uh, use this precise word that actually for how they have to be take uh, this next feasible next step has to be taken. For I would like to discuss uh, uh, the designing the policy brief. Um, it's uh, how actually now we have discussed about the content and now we know how this, what is the objective and how, what, where we are going, but to make the policy base really attractive uh, to the policymaker, some of, there are some of the tips that we can use. Um, so for designing your policy base, it's very important to use, uh, if, if possible, a template uh, that your if you have a series of paper, um, series of uh, research, you can actually use the same design for a designer and, and share it with your audience so that the understand is coming from the same research group or same and who is uh, coming up with this uh, policy brief and um, uh, the policy our policymaker will understand uh, that and would value that the design and presentation of your research briefs are important considerations and it can help keep the reader engaged uh, we have to think about the titles and headings, the sidebars, use of lists, and of course, the graphics. For titles and heading, titles acts as a reference point to anticipate readers. It include, uh, it, you can include subtitles or subheadings to break up the text and draw readers' attention. 
to the main topic uh, of this each sections because as I mentioned that this is actually for the audience. So if you actually have a main title that actually people know what is it about and then a little bit of description of it and with some your key recommendation, sometimes it's also very helpful. And you can use, use a verb word to make the headings more dynamic. And you can use phrase headings as questions to spark the reader's curiosity. And headings should also contain relevant information without being too long. Sometimes you can use sidebars. In some, in some policy briefs, you can use sidebars to really for the key results, highlighting the key results in a sidebar. Uh, and the readers can, to hook the reader's attention. It's, it, can, it can add greater depth in the main discussion uh, and, uh, and they can directly go to the key results and then come back to the main results section to, uh, to go if they want some more detail in that particular result. The, it is uh, very, uh, to, uh, what are the sidebars? And they uh, visually break up the brief and make documents easier to read. They should be, but the, this sidebar should be short, descriptive, engaging, and action oriented. Sometimes you can also use lists. Lists are an effective and visually interesting way to simplify um, the dense content. Uh, they should be no longer than five or seven bullet points. Usually six or five or six is, is best. Uh, each bullet point should express complete thoughts and we should avoid using the bullet points that are only uh, one or two words in length. So uh, instead, actually, we should have very clear and concise uh, um, way of expressing that have a complete thought. And graphics, of course, graphics is very important. It, 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 these visuals, uh, visuals are easily one of the best ways to make policy brief more interesting for readers. Uh, every visual um, should serve a purpose and help to illustrate your argument. We can choose effective visuals uh, or for the information you would like to communicate. You can, uh, and for every visual, we should include captions for photos and other visuals to explain the content to the reader. See, sometimes these visuals, um, it can be results, the findings of the results, like here um, is an example of actually how uh, the description of different results. Uh, uh, the findings of different results, but you can also actually um, share a, a schematic diagram of a problem, stating a problem, and uh, to make your argument very attractive to your reader, and uh, also highlight uh, what if, if you have any specific section, you can highlight that in, in a in a uh, in a particular way. And revising the policy piece is very, very important, uh, uh, of course, and we need to reflect once again about its purpose, uh, its audience, the content and structure. After we have written our policy brief, we need to go back and ask ourselves that is it um, has is the purpose okay or is it is is it it's um, if the is the audience um, we know the audience or not or whether the content is appropriate for this particular audience and the structure whether we are following this structure or the components of a policy brief, and um, we can actually try it by by using an elevator pitch, a 20 second elevator pitch to assess what information stand out. We can see actually what, whenever we are explaining it, we, are, we take the best uh, or most important our, the recommendation that I'd like to convey. Uh, so that's, it's a very great way actually to understand actually what is the, our uh, information that stands out. And we can make it user friendly as possible by removing jargons and statistics that makes less appro approachable. And we can ask a colleague with no prior knowledge of the issue to read the brief and provide feedback. Finally, it's, uh, it's very important to use your policy brief. We, we have written this policy brief, but in the entire policy cycle, not only at the agenda setting, but also to emphasize your work, to take this, uh, to make the policy change, and not only to the policy formulation, but also the implementation stage, you should highlight and use your policy brief. A good policy brief can play a double duty by standing on its own uh, as an effective 
accompaniment to a presentation. And you can actually, whenever you're making a presentation, you can, you can have a policy brief uh, with you and you can distribute to your audience and they can uh, see that actually this has been written and this is a summary of your the presentation that you'll be delivering. And we can tailor any accompanying visual presentations to your brief by focusing only on the key points and answering important questions. So do not actually repeat whatever you have um, already presenting in your presentation or, or, or and but take some of the important ones, only the key points and some of the important questions that has to be answered. So you can take that in your um, presentation and uh, uh, the, the, it can rest can be in your policy brief. And we should, as I mentioned, we shouldn't be repeating all your briefs text in your presentation. Uh, so uh, that's uh, all from my side. I, I, I hope this is um, this has given you some idea about how to write a policy brief. I know you have lots of questions. Uh, let's, uh, let's hear from you. Thank you. Over to you. Yeah, thanks Pleasure. very much, uh, Dr. Shafiq, for uh, this informing as well as insightful presentation on how to write a policy brief. Uh, I'm sure we have really learned quite a lot from this because the, in most cases when you you are, uh, you, we have heard about policy brief, some, but sometimes we're not sure which direction to take. For example, a simple question to say, how long should a policy, be, a policy brief be like? We have seen some policy briefs having four pages, five pages, but uh, you have really clarified why we don't need to make it so long. So it's, it's really very uh, informing, but also important in research as we try to ensure that the research we conduct should always influence policy in one way or another because the research that is implemented without really uh, presenting these results to, to the policy makers doesn't really, it may not be or, or meaningful. People have done research, very good research, but because there isn't good communication to the policy makers, the research is not really being used. So writing a policy brief uh, really is an important area and the, the, the starting point is to know how to write it so that the results should be useful. So I think uh, uh, we have a lot of questions, uh, a lot of areas uh, that require clarification uh, from the audience. And I think uh, uh, it's time for us to look into this. And I should encourage the audience to keep on uh, writing any questions that you still have or areas that you want to be uh, clarified, uh, just keep on putting them in the Q&A section and they will try to ensure that uh, we address uh, all these questions or uh, these uh, areas that require clarification. Uh, Dr. Shafiq, there's a question here from Roderick uh, Sambakons, uh, who, who is trying to say to ask on if your goal of developing a policy brief is to influence or inform what methods can you use in order to influence uptake? So there's that area that needs clarification. I'm not sure if we can uh, start with that one. Uh, if you could repeat that uh, again, um, sorry, doctor. I okay. just did some, there was some noise. I couldn't hear you. All right, so the question from Roderick is, uh, if your goal of developing a policy brief is to influence or inform what methods can you use in order to enforce uptake? Okay. All right. So it's a, like I mentioned that in in the policy brief, you, there are two um, for informing. So there are actually uh, there are some infographs. It's actually sometimes whenever you'd like to actually make uh, uh, some, um, it's of course you'd like to just mean, briefly describe the problem. Maybe they don't still you don't have the. Um, you don't have the results yet. You just want to inform that how important this information is, that how important this area is. And there is a need for a research, need for more research or needs for more policy attention. For example, at the start of the research, when we are actually developing a research questions, it's also important to bring in your policy makers to understand their perspective as well. So in that time, you can actually, for informing the policy makers about this, uh, you can 
describe the information and in a pictorial manner and uh, come up with some infographs rather than policy brief. Uh, policy brief that usually has recommendation, uh, but if you'd like to just give shared some information, you can call them research brief or evidence brief. So there are actually options of using uh, evidence brief as well. So this is a summary of research evidence to inform the policymakers uh, rather than actually to take any action based on this. So maybe at, at a later stage, um, uh, you can also write a policy brief, but to start with, you can start with a research brief or evidence brief to start the conversation. And at a later stage, you can develop this uh, uh, policy brief. I hope you are, uh, it answer your questions, but it's usually you use a lot of infograph and um, very in a simple language uh, in during your agenda setting, you can uh, use this infograph to inform your policymaker. I hope that answer your question. Yeah, I, I hope uh, it has really uh, answered well. You have really answered well to the audience. But uh, I think you have raised an important area there as well of writing a research brief. Uh, maybe if we have time at the end, maybe something that you may want to just give a brief explanation to the difference between a policy brief but uh, and a policy brief and a research brief. But since we have a lot of questions here, let's move on uh, to this other question from God David, uh, who is trying to find out on, uh, is, is asking, is it okay to make a reference to other researchers work when you are writing your policy brief? Yes, usually um, I haven't mentioned it um, here particularly. Of course, in the if you go to the resources in in various research, um, so there are it's it's very important you, you refer refer to some of the very important uh, findings. And uh, for example, if you already have a publication, if you can refer to that those paper, but also in your background section or introduction section, if there is an important systematic review that has been done, uh, or if there is a WHO guideline or 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 mm -hmm. Uh, something very in the international level or in the global level, uh, some study has been done like the global burden of disease. Uh, so these kind of important findings you can always refer to, but because of the limited time, uh, limited uh, scope of presenting references, you should limit it to four or five or about, uh, about four or five key references, and you can use it at the end of your um, end of your policy brief, uh, and uh, before you share your contacts, share your acknowledgement, so you can also you, you could you could use those uh, references. Yes, thank you. Ah, thanks very much for that. Uh, so it's indeed uh, uh, okay to include uh, reference in the policy brief, and I think that answers our next question as well, which was the about uh, whether it is necessary to include a list of references in a policy brief. And if from your explanation, you are emphasizing that we can do that, but maybe it should be not a long list of references, maybe four to five should be okay. Otherwise, uh, it will be just too long as well. So I'm sure that question has been responded uh, at the same. Uh, we go to the next question from Alex. Uh, a small labeled template, uh, preferably two pages, would prove very useful. In addition to the, okay, this is, I think, it's just a comment uh, saying that uh, a small labeled template, preferably two pages, would prove very useful in addition uh, to what has been presented by you. So that is just a comment from Alex. But uh, let's go on to another question uh, from Anandi Kumar. It's uh, on the Sidebars are effective for which component of the briefs template? You have talked about the sidebar, using the sidebars. So are uh, important for which uh, section uh, of the brief or component of the brief? It's mostly the research overview section. Like whenever you're writing your result, uh, key findings, then there you can actually write uh, in the, take out some of the key points and present in a sidebar. Uh, but at the same time, you can also use some, if it is important, if you, and it's your research, you will be designing actually the, uh, how you'd like to present your results. So sometimes it, it, I have seen it presenting the key results in the front page as well uh, on, on a sidebar. But usually it's actually, it's important uh, to uh, keep it in a, in a, where actually the readers, uh, uh, to catch the readers' attention. Um, sometimes you can highlight that in your 
results section, sorry, research overview section, but also you can bring it in the front page. Uh, if you're writing your um, executive summary as a paragraph, then your key results can be shared um, uh, on a right-hand side on a, on a list or, uh, as it, or, um, or as a sidebar. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for that. I'm sure that one has been answered as well. Can a policy brief using evidence in literature serve as an implementation research? This is a question from somewhere. Of course, that it's very important. And nowadays we know that how important it is uh, to conduct as well as share the findings of uh, an implementation research, because we know actually what needs to be done and it's where it's most evidence is needed is how this uh, our um, uh, the implementation uh, implementation science is getting more and more important. And uh, of course, this information based on implementation research should be shared and uh, it's it will be even more relevant to the policymakers because policymakers are more interested in this implementation science and what's happening in the really in the ground and how that their uh, decisions uh, that they are going to take can be uh, influenced by this implementation. So of course you can use based on the implementation research findings, you can prepare uh, evidence um, brief and at the same time in your references, in your background, you can use the findings of implementation research uh, and get the uh, evidence from there uh, to make it more relevant to your research problem. Mm -hmm. uh, thank, thanks very much uh, for that. Uh, there's a, another question here from, from Wasi. Uh, can we write policy brief targeting influential stakeholders, not a direct policy makers? How about balance in of, 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 of authoring policy brief, bias or conflict of interest. I'm sure that's really an interesting area as well. This is very important. This is absolutely important, specifically where uh, the loss of vested interest in lobby group and are there, right? So we have to be very careful about from the policymakers' perspective, and it's not only about our from the our side, uh, but also at the from the receiving end side. From the, for example, where we are evidence producers as researchers, but the evidence users are our policymakers, where they actually can get not only from the uh, for for an evidence based uh, policy making process sometimes actually it's a uh, it's not always it's based on evidence so uh, sometimes the policy makers get lots of information or brief that actually are not based on evidence uh, so this conflict of interest and uh, other thing we have to if there is any conflict of interest we need to clearly mention if it is possible and not if it was it's our ethical i think moral duty if there is any conflict of interest, we can state it in a uh, um, uh, in a briefly that uh, for there is no conflict and interest in the in the authors or we could actually mention mention that if there is any uh, but in general I think actually it's a, from for any scientific document production of a scientific scientific document it's necessary but usually in the policy brief it's not uh, absolutely necessary to, uh, but you can actually mention if there is there is but it's if it is important for your context it would be absolutely um, important uh, but it will depend on your context and the problem that you're dealing with. Ah, thanks very much. So there's a need to declare a conflict of interest if there's a need to do so uh, while we are writing in our policy. That's quite important as well. Uh, there's another question from Kefri here. Uh, after we accomplish research, we might publish it. How can we reach to decide that this study needs a policy brief report. Are there any ways, criteria to consider other than stated here? Do we need to consult experts, the need for a policy brief? So these are some of the key questions from Kefri. I think whenever a research is designed, it's designed to answer some knowledge gap 
or address some knowledge gap. Wherever there is a knowledge gap, that's why actually we are doing this study. So I think each of the research can have some ultimate ob objective of some policy implications, if not one particular research. For example, if it's a laboratory uh, bench science or it is, the research is based on bench science, sometimes the researcher on, uh, can think that, okay, we this is a bench science, we don't probably do not have much uh, relevance to the policy making, but however, this you can actually um, collaborate with your uh, public health uh, researchers in the similar topic. Maybe you're working in a, in a one health approach or working in every um, for um, for spillover of uh, uh, any virus from a lab to uh, the community or something like that. But ultimately, say it has a public health significance. So you can actually, um, for all I, what I want to meant to, meant to share is actually for each of the research has um, importance. Each of the research has important and policy implications, and you can actually come up with a policy a brief based on your research findings, or you can be a summary of several research in a similar area, and then you can actually group your all of the research and with your colleagues and come up with one policy brief to move that particular agenda. Mm -hmm. So maybe in, a, in, a, in other ways, can we also say that uh, when uh, you are designing your research, uh, during the initial stages, you should also consider what kind of policy brief you may write from this research. Yes, yes. It's always very important to, at the very beginning, uh, think about the policy implications of this particular research problem or of, of this study. So then uh, take it from there. So uh, at the end of the research, whenever you're finishing it, you, you start not only with your research report and, uh, and uh, statistical or, or your scientific uh, uh, manuscript, but also you write a policy brief so that our your audience uh, can get an idea uh, from what you, you have done, uh, your uh, the target audience, and all, all, sometimes actually for our research, it's actually we are also uh, we talk about this in our organization as well. How we do lots of research, and uh, ultimately, we very few are actually communicated to the policymakers. So we are taking some active steps. We have formulated a policy translation cell in our organization, and we are also com collaborating with our organization, our partner in the in the government. Uh, I see through ICGDB's initiative, a research policy policy communication cell has been uh, formulated in Ministry of Health. So we have uh, now we are linking uh, and communicating our whenever there is a research finding, we have an important, we think there is a policy relevance. We try to have a presentation in the research policy communication cell so that and involving other researchers, other policymakers, and, and then there is a um, exchange between policymakers and researchers, and so both are interested in the who are both interested in this topic. So there is a way of actually not only writing the policy brief and producing a policy brief, but take some active steps and uh, taking it to the further. Uh, and this is actually cause researchers push, but and uh, but it has to be not only researchers pull or uh, policymakers pull. It has to be very integrated uh, policymaking process. Okay, thanks very much for that clarification. Uh, there's another exciting question here from Messerine. Can you develop a policy brief from a research, a research whose findings are, are yet to be published? That's a very question, and that's, this, this is something that uh, we get this question all the time, and we also ask these questions uh, whenever we were, we are, we were writing um, or getting training on, on this, writing a policy brief. Uh, of course, there is, a, it's, it would be based on your preliminary research, but because you will be, it will not it will be very context specific as well that if it is very urgent for example in these covid situations you have come up with a research which which can that can absolutely make some changes in your policy decision you shouldn't be waiting 
for, for the, your results to be published and then taking it to the policymakers. It's not, um, uh, it, should not, it should not be the right way to do. So I think it's, it's important for some of the research findings, but that you can, if, it, if you're not actually present um, you, and you are main, you're main, uh, preparing your results in a way that are not presented in, in the scientific uh, article, it's maybe your key results. So it's, uh, you can actually take this research results in your policy bill. That's what um, recently, previously we thought that you have to wait until your research uh, results to be published, but considering the importance and urgency, you can always, and if it, you're targeting some specific audience for, for a policy change, which is time sensitive, you can actually write a policy brief and take it to the policy, uh, to the audience. So that's what my understanding is, but uh, uh, others can think differently. Uh, that's uh, what I understand. Thanks. Okay, uh, thanks for that as well. Uh, it's quite exciting. Uh, there's another question from Roderick. Uh, he's saying that it seems it is very difficult to come up with target audience for a policy brief than a press release. In most cases, policymakers can be a well-known group of people. Can you please clarify if you can? So yes, it is. It, you have. You're right that it's very difficult to reach to the poli to the policy uh, uh, policymakers. So that is why it's very important to have a have a think tank or a policy it's called knowledge brokers a group that actually brings they know the language they they can um they can read the research results and they can interpret the research result and they know the language to take this evidence to the policymakers so the researchers often are not skilled uh, we do not actually have the skill to communicate uh effectively communicate our research results to the policymakers so often it's very important or it's a uh, it's 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 it is ideal to have a knowledge broker. It's a, the name. I do not like the knowledge broker word, but this is actually it's an accepted one in the evidence uh, informed health policy making arena. So this knowledge breaker or a think tank group, a, a, a lobby group or a pressure group, and uh, that they can actually take this agenda uh, forward. Uh, and um, and as an important uh, as an important group, media or the journalists and can play an important role. Uh, this. Uh, you can um, um, write a press uh, release and where there will be only a few research findings can be presented in a particular way, but your policy brief uh, par uh, has a different purpose, in an additional purpose to really write it convincingly and also sharing the result in the, in the, in the, in the um, uh, in the daily newspaper, it would not be presented in the way you would like to present it. They will, the journalists will write their own way. They know they know actually how to put it in a layman's language, but for the arguments and everything, it's it's better if you pre create a policy brief and tar share it with the target audience and through the use of this knowledge broker group. So if I understand that this is not the case, not every country or it's um, there is a knowledge and for not every Every um, area, there is a knowledge broker group or, or a think tank, but we can actually identify some people who are champions in this area and use this channel to reach to the policymakers. Uh, so, who, so who can actually uh, convince the policymakers um, to take their next the take uh, next steps? I can come back to this um, presentation. I can come back to this discussion. Uh, this is very important, but uh, it's absolutely necessary to engage the journalists and uh, and uh, how to write it. We can uh, engaging with them. We can actually be benefited for and and have an active role of them in the knowledge translation process. Okay, thank you for that. And the uh, writing a, 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 a policy brief is one thing, and whether that policy brief is making an impact to the audience or to the to the policymakers is, is another is another issue. I'm saying this because the, there are three questions here related to that. Uh, Mary, uh, Grace, and Roderick as well. They are trying to to find out uh, how how do we monitor uptake and impact of our policy brief. Or in other ways, how can we measure uh, the effectiveness of our policy brief once we have we have presented it? If we can say something on this based on your experience as well. Yeah. 
Thank you for this question. This is absolutely important. And I, I understand there's lots of discussion in this area as well in the evidence-informed health policymaking area. Uh, it's not only about, uh, we uh, our, our today's focus is, uh, uh, our today's focus of this session is how to write a policy brief us, but you have uh, rightly mentioned about the key, key issue, like, we have written this. Uh, ultimately, whether it's really had an impact on the policymaking process or not, or it has been has um, made some changes, and ultimately, um, uh, some policy has been implemented, the resources have been allocated or not, that is most uh, most important. So uh, for that, it's, it will be, um, I, I would like to just mention that using, uh, engaging the policymakers from the very beginning, is very important. So that so that they take this and take the interest and the entire policy process and there's a, we engage them and update them and ultimately follow them up. But for evaluating that whether your policy making process your policy had a role or not, it's it's quite difficult. It's quite difficult to uh, to assess, but. You can actually, through your qualitative investigation, at the beginning of the research, if it is a five-year research, sometimes you know that it takes time to make a policy change. And you can, uh, usually from policy to implementation, it's also sometimes take eight to 10 years. So you, what you can do actually, like in, if um, uh, you can continually look at the uh, the policy position can be uh, documented through qualitative investigations and also some uh, some reviewing of the um, the national nationally representative database uh, data sets. You can see where actually this is stands, and ultimately at the end where. I, um, if there is any change in five year, around, uh, in the five year, and uh, if it is a little bit of five year project, you can do a, uh, in the you can explore the policy position at the beginning, where you are um, in a, through a stakeholder consultation. And at the end, uh, you can also identify actually where your policymakers are with regard to this uh, particular topic. Has there any influence um, in this particular area? From our um, experience, I can share actually one of uh, a few. Um, uh, I work in the urban health area, urban health and nutrition area, and we have been constantly advocating about improving urban health and nutrition in our um, and uh, in the. But there is a, in Bangladesh the Minister of Health and Minister of Local Government, there is actually um, there is a there is a lack of role clarification for who will be actually looking at uh, urban primary healthcare setting. So we have been advocating for um, for long time. It's very little change, but however, we engage the mayor. Um, uh, from the very beginning and uh, repeated through repeated uh, engagement with the mayors and um, a series of policy dialogues. Now we are saying changing a shift in the mindset in the Minister of Health as well in the local government and how they should be engaged and can work together uh, in the urban space and uh, doing their what what they do. Some can take a role active role in the service delivery, but local government can take more social determinants of health and broader aspects uh, in, in those areas. So it's it really takes time for a, for a policy change, policy process change, but documented this, uh, it has to be actually done simultaneously and, and continually through process documentation, uh, through rigorous mixed method research approaches. So I, I will just stop there. I understand that lots of ideas can be discussed through this uh, course. Uh, and today we are focusing on how to write a policy brief. I understand this will be a continuous discussion throughout this course. Thanks. Yeah, for sure. And uh, uh, in most cases, uh, when, when people talk about uh, writing a policy brief, uh, it's, it's mostly associated maybe with the randomized trials or research that has been conducted for a long time, interventions at type of studies. But the uh, careful here is, try, is trying to find out whether we can also prepare a policy brief for a research that has just been done maybe once and maybe even for a short period of time. Is it necessary to do a, a policy brief for that? Something that is a, a short research and it's just being done once, and then it's, 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 that's it. Uh, 
I, I think actually if, if it is based, for example, if it is based on a rapid quantitative survey, for example, there is a, uh, you know uh, that uh, there are forcibly displaced Myanmar population like the Rohingya population. Uh, we have uh, the migrant uh, migrants, uh, uh, Rohingya migrants here in Bangladesh. So, uh, to even there is a quick evaluation was needed. So, if you for this kind of, um, for example, the Ukraine crisis or very recent any recent crisis, if you'd like to quickly do a, a, a situation analysis or, or some uh, quick evidence synthesis, and based on that, you can always write a policy brief and to reach to the uh, to the key target policymakers, and uh, that's what I think. And if it is even if it is a very small study, even if it's but if it is part particular. And if it can change some policies of the target of, um, through your work, uh, why not? I, I, I see, I think it's important to do the work, but of course, if it is, a, if it is something that needs that attention, uh, it needs a systematic review and a meta-analysis and find a summarizing of uh, other evidences to come up with the solid evidence and then advocacy, um, do the advocacy, so that it would depend on the problem. That's what I think. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much for that. And the, there's another exciting question here uh, from Maria and Morris. Uh, uh, because uh, you, you can have the policy brief, but uh, how, how best can you uh, present it? Or in other words, uh, where should you submit it to, to have an impact? Is it in a journal? Or do you want to put it maybe in a, in a newspaper? Or do you want to seek an audience with the policymakers themselves? What would be the best communication channel to present your policy brief? Yes, uh, I, 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 yes, I think I was muted for some reason and I just unmuted. Yeah. Um, so I think actually uh, there are many ways of policy communication or science communication. So we are today we are talking about writing a policy brief and describe uh, the content and what should be there in this uh, in the policy brief. But you're absolutely right. If we, if it is an opinion piece in a in a um, daily newspaper, it can draw attention to um, a thousand readers uh, very very quickly and more than like ten thousand or one hundred thousand readers very quickly and. Uh, Sometimes in Bangladesh, we have um, the most circulated daily, sometimes organized roundtable discussions uh, with particular topic. And after this roundtable discussions, this uh, one whole page is dedicated to uh, share what was discussed and kind uh, share this policy recommendation from that discussion. Uh, so it's it's very effective way of uh, communicating in science and in to to the audience and also uh, engaging citizens, you know, like this, of course, you have to engage your citizens, not only uh, we are trying to communicate to the policymaker to make change, but the citizen has to be at the center. So if we are if, uh, engaging with the, um, uh, so you have to actually think about your, the problem, if it is more related that uh, citizens would understand and it's uh, uh, for, for, and they would, um, this will create some pressure to their uh, respective uh, ward commissioner or the local government. So uh, we can, we should always engage that. So particularly we have to, have to think of the uh, for our communication of our research how best we can communicate uh, to the target audience uh, to the policymakers this is needed but also sometimes writing an opinion piece or having a roundtable discussion uh, is it can also be very helpful and uh, what we did actually in one of our research project it was called the share project the uh, strengthening health applying research evidence so, so we did at icddb we for universal achieving universal health coverage so we actually trained journalists. So we had series of training with the journalists with this specific topic on knowledge translation. And uh, we, um, after the training, uh, these journalists were very interested in our topic, the whatever we were sharing and the, uh, of, for the universal health coverage and how uh, for financial risk protection, what needs to be done, why urban poor, focusing on urban poor is not only important for reducing urban poverty, uh, but 
also achieving universal health coverage. So all these things they started writing um, in their um, in the daily newspaper. So engaging with the uh, with journalists and other and that can actually be a very effective way of uh, communicating your science. But for policy brief, policy brief is this four page or two page document uh, that is uh, targeted to the uh, the policymakers and uh, it's it, usually it's not published in the national daily newspaper it's uh, you publish you usually publish it you can sometimes if there is a in a government or in a in your research organization there is a a specific template, you, you can use that. Otherwise, you can actually design your own policy brief. Um, that's what I we, we usually do, um, to design your own policy brief based on the research needs and your audience. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, I think it's really important. Uh, one, one issue that you have raised there is the, uh, engaging uh, uh, the community. So uh, well, that's really important that when we are preparing policy briefs, we may not only focus on the policymakers, but also uh, the, the, the community in general, because they may help uh, supporting uh, or blowing the trumpet that we are trying to blow to the policymakers. And that's really something quite important that we may want to target. And this implies that we may need to use uh, different ways uh, of communicating our policy brief uh, with the, with the, to the policymakers, not only targeting the policymakers. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead. Uh -huh. I was just wondering that, uh, that for policy, may, policy brief, we usually we think of uh, the English language, but you can always use your own la country language to make it has more impact and um, to like I mentioned the engaging citizens in, in the policy dialogues we are also uh, sometimes if it is targeted if it is we know about the Chatham House rule in the Chatham House you are not inviting the media uh, in that policy dialogues so there it can be English and but if it is an open policy dialogue where you're also inviting um, uh, general public uh, in a, one of our, not one, a series of policy dialogues, we invited um, uh, authors, we invited filmmakers, we invited act activists, uh, some general public rep representative of the urban poor community. Sometimes we invited adolescents, adolescent girls and boys. So to really engage them, if your policy brief is written in your language, in your own language, it would be more engaging engaging the discussion if it is in your own language it's uh, it will always have more impact and uh, there will be more demand on the on the topic um, and uh, and the newspaper and engaging the media is of absolutely important and that level but you may think of actually if you're uh, and uh, maybe you can you would like to have two separate uh, meetings one is in the inside or what uh, what needs to be done and uh, and then in a broader uh, with public and with broader media engagement after you have decided Decided what are the key recommendations, then you can go there. Maybe. Yeah, that's quite another important comment that he, we may present our brief in a language which we think uh, will be effective in delivering the content. So thanks for that, because sometimes we ignore the local language, which is also very powerful uh, in transmitting the message uh, about our research. There's a, a quick question here from Fred, uh, who is just trying to, to, to seek a brief clarification on the two types of policy briefs that you have said. Yes, I think this is a, uh, I sh um, what for this today's presentation, I wanted to make it very general. Otherwise, uh, it will be um, complex for de describing two different uh, policy brief uh, in one presentation. But generally, this advocacy brief, you actually know your what you're going to advocate. Uh, you you know that this is the solution. Um, you want your government to enact. You want your policymakers to uptake. So then you actually pre prepare your, your advocacy brief. This is a, the advocacy brief and objective is both a policy brief, uh, but it, you will know, you would not say, say that you will in on the top, you will write your policy brief, but you would know this is an advocacy brief and you will actually take it, uh, write your advocacy brief in, in your policy in a way that actually advocates one particular um, area, not one or maybe several, but you know that, that this is the, um, uh, this is the area that the you uh, the results or you would like our recommendation. You'd like the policymakers to update. So that's your advocacy briefs. On the objective briefs, on the other hand, you can mention several options. Uh, for example, uh, in one of our research, 
for improving public health workforce, what we did, we actually identified what should be done in short term, medium term, and long term. We identified the potential solutions, a potential recommendation uh, through quality investigation. And through, uh, with stakeholder consultation, we identify of this uh, potential policy recommendation, what should be done immediately in a short term, what should be done in middle uh, midterm, and what should be done in long, long run. So uh, then there you can actually give some options. So these are objective briefs where you have to lay out your options and ask your policymakers to Take out, take the options based on the need. If it is an something needs to be done immediately and resources need to can go uh, very easily with the existing um, uh, policies and in place, maybe that that can be that recommendation can be taken. So this is there are these are called objective briefs. But at the beginning, you have to decide uh, what you are going to um, make. Whether we are, are you writing a advocacy brief or are you writing an objective briefs? Objective brief. Uh, let me just repeat that this gives the policymakers some options. They will decide based on the possible option, options, which one to take. All right, uh, thank you very much uh, for that. I think uh, the discussion is just quite exciting. And uh, there's another uh, interesting question here from Ora Jojo. Uh, it's trying to find out uh, who, who should write a policy brief. Is, is it a, an NA career researcher? A long time experienced researcher? Is it a professor? Who should really like this? Was, that's really an important question as well, because sometimes uh, you find yourself in a situation whereby if, if, you, if you're a junior researcher, maybe the, the, the PI may just say, Can you write this? Is it really supposed to be like that? Or it should be the, the PI himself or herself doing this job? What's your experience on this? I think it should be um, everyone involved in the research because everyone has their own perspective. Then uh, the PI or the senior researchers, or uh, they would have their, of course, they have their wealth of knowledge. But at the same time, uh, the junior researchers or who have the time to write it, they actually know they can see the, the problem in a different different way, and they would uh, have more energy to uh, go through the different literature and understand different policy brief and write a very nice policy brief. So I think actually it should be it should be a team team effort. Of course, it has to be um, the there should be engagement of the young researchers of, as well uh, because uh, they have different voice and their voice has to be heard. Uh, they are the um, uh, they are smart and uh, of course the, uh, their voice has to be heard as well as the or the uh, the uh, researchers who has wealth of knowledge and, and worked in this area and know who uh, how to approach the policymaker, which policymakers would uh, uh, would listen to what kind of um, expert advice. So maybe we, we need to have a mix of uh, the, all the researchers. That's what mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, thanks for that. I think uh, it's very clear that he, he, from, from what you have said, everyone involved in research should have a responsibility to write the policy, even for the young researchers, because it's a learning process for them as well. So thanks for that. For There's another question here from Caroline. She's trying to find out uh, what's the difference between a policy brief and a problem analysis? Do we follow the same criteria or something different? Uh, to my understanding, it's uh, of, of, in the problem analysis. Of course, this is you can summarize the uh, problem. You can summarize actually what is the gap in your knowledge, and uh, um, uh, and then actually mention some of the key aspects of that problem. And on the other hand, in the policy brief, you actually come up with the. It starts from, uh, of course, you state your problem, but it it actually ends with the recommendations. It's our ultimate goal is formulating recommendations and advocating the recommendations, advocating the taking the research results and putting it um, to the policymakers table so that they, uh, they uh, to help the process of evidence informed health policy making. So I think there are um, the objective uh, are different. That's what I understand, but it might might be wrong. So, but it's, it's just to me. I just think that these are the objectives of writing a problem analysis uh, um, is different to uh, the objectives of writing a policy brief. Okay, 
thank you very much for that, saying that the objectives are different and they, they, could, they could also follow a different path as we, we prepare them. Um, Sabira Nelson is trying to find out what mobilization strategies can a researcher employ to convene the target audience for a policy brief? That's very, very important. Uh, first of all, I think actually we have to understand the stakeholders. To understand the stakeholder, we need to take some um, uh, steps in uh, some doing some stakeholder analysis as well as uh, uh, stakeholder mapping and analysis. First, of course, uh, we need to understand the who are our um, who are the stakeholders, including the general public. Of course, in, in, including the citizens. So if it is about um, uh, our garments, ready made garments factory workers, it shouldn't be only the minister, commerce ministers, or the labor ministry that we talk about. Uh, we should, of course, we should talk to the, um, to our, um, uh, to the, um, day laborer or workers in the garden, you know, those factories. So we have to really understand our stakeholder, map the uh, stakeholder, and then analyze and do the stakeholder analysis. We know that based on their influence and their interests, we can identify the drivers who will be actually taking these ideas forward. Uh, or uh, sometimes if you, if you are very clever, you should uh, can identify the blockers and somehow bypass the blockers and work with the um, drivers who will take your idea or agenda forward. So it's very important uh, to for the, the to take the strategy to, uh, to do the mapping, stakeholder mapping, uh, do the stakeholder analysis and identify your drivers and work with them. And then actually have series of dialogue, not one. Usually if you do only one dialogue on, um, so you know, sometimes it cannot work. So you have to have a series of dialogue and have different channels how disseminating, not only with, our, like I mentioned, like it may be a Chatham House rule where media is not invited, or if it's a closed door meeting, or you can also have a, uh, later on, you can have an engaging media, you can have a broader meeting. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's, that's really important, especially uh, if, if you are, if you, if you know that he, if, you, if you writing a policy brief is included at the initial design of your research, uh, you have raised an important point that we may need to come up with a, a stakeholder mapping analysis so that you should know who are your stakeholders so that by the end of uh, the end of the study or you want to, to, to produce a policy brief, you right away know which one should you, do you want to target. So conducting a stakeholder uh, mapping analysis is one of the key issues that we may need to conduct uh, to ensure that our policy brief will have an influence and will know which one should be targeted. Um, there's a, uh, a question from uh, Perpetua, as well as the, uh, uh, someone wants clarification on the, the difference between a policy brief to a research brief, or are these similar? But in the same, <laughs> in the same vein, um, people would want to seek clarification. I'm sure you can tackle them together. Okay. People would like to seek clarification uh, on a policy brief, an advocacy brief, and an objective brief. So I think I just I think I just covered this advocacy brief and objective brief in my earlier answer. Uh, I, I was actually also looking at these questions because uh, the, again, just to repeat that an advocacy brief, both advocacy brief and objective brief, both are policy brief. Uh, but for advocacy brief, you know actually what uh, recommendation you would like to. Uh, make it forward or uh, on, on our objective briefs you actually lay down your options uh, for the policymaker to make decisions which one is feasible for their context so these are these are the two major uh, division of the policy brief if i could actually share my screen just to, just to keep that because there are questions on that uh, so I will just, um, it will be uh, important that two types of uh, policy brief, can everyone sh see? Yes, yes, you can see it. Okay, so uh, let me just quickly mention, I put it in the uh, full screen mode. Okay, so there are two types of policy brief, the advocacy brief and objective brief, both are policy brief. And uh, in the, on the top of your um, um, 
uh, your policy brief on the right hand side or left hand side, you can write it's a policy brief, but you would know whether it's an advocacy brief or an objective brief. If you are writing an advocacy brief, you would argue for a particular course of action. You would under you would request or recommend your policymaker to do this to take this particular course of action uh, as as recommendation. On the other hand, for objective briefs, you provide a balanced information on several policy options. Like I just mentioned that what should be done in the short term, several options, what should be done in the middle, medium term, and what should be done in the uh, long term. Then from that list of policy recommendations, the um, your policymakers can take uh, an informed decision what is actually is feasible to make the news because they also have, especially from the developing country setting, they also has a challenge, right? So that's that's why we need to give them some solution options. And also we can mention that we did this uh, um, cost effectiveness uh, analysis and uh, this, you know, maybe this is expensive, but ultimately it will be, uh, it will give this return. Uh, if we are import, if we invest in nutrition, if we invest in adolescent nutrition, ultimately it's going to give you return in so many aspects. So these are something that you can give these uh, options to your policymakers. Thank you for that. Uh, where we explained uh, on the advocacy brief, where you may be specific on, on an issue, while an objective brief, uh, you may give a number of options for the policymakers to make. Uh, what he, maybe what you may need also to explain a bit is on the research brief. Yes, okay, yes. And in a research brief is actually is uh, uh, there, you uh, summarize your research. It's uh, you, you, in a pictorial manner. It's uh, like an infograph. You can summarize what, in the, what was your background or objective, what were the key methods you, you took and ultimately describe in a, in a graphical uh, man, man, manner uh, and uh, based on your evidence, what you have found. But their recommendation some may not be, uh, sometimes it's not as relevant as the policy brief. Some, and this research brief to my understanding can be a little more um, scientific compared to the policy brief. Here you can share some of, some of the research results that are understandable by the researchers. But this because this research brief, you're going to share with your community, your researchers community, not the policymaker community. So to my understanding, this research brief, whenever we prepare research brief, we prepare it for researchers. And policy brief is prepared for policymakers. That's the main difference I understand. Thanks for that. Uh... Uh, explanation, which is really straightforward. Uh, uh, that's really good. Um, maybe we should be now going to the end of our session, but uh, there's one question, one question that maybe if you can respond to that one as well uh, from Zuma. Uh, it's trying to find out, do we have to declare in the brief that the study results are not yet uh, uh, that, that, that the study results are noted out if you are to publish this uh, first. You need to declare. I think that's a good idea. That's a good idea. And also you can sh mention it's a preliminary findings because sometimes uh, when you actually do uh, share it with your um, peer review um, in your for peer review journals, of course you get uh, some important recommendation for um, uh, revising your results or, or doing some further analysis. So I, if it is very important, and like I mentioned, usually previously we used to do it only about the published research, but it is, if it is actually important like COVID-like situation or very uh, in that, then you can uh, I highlight some of, and you can mention at some point, these are preliminary results based on this research. Like we do it in our, in our in our abstracts or uh, when we present it in a conference paper, it's exactly yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, thanks very much uh, for that. Uh, um, as we are going to ask Lizzie, uh, as a chair, I think I can have the privilege to ask, to ask a question as well. Let's say you have, you have, you have uh, produced, you, you have released some uh, articles in, in the peer reviewed journals and then at the end, that's when you are writing your policy brief. Do you think it is necessary to include the, the links of the publications into this policy brief? Or that is not necessary for the policymakers? 
I think nowadays because uh, it's uh, it's always it's important to have some key references. If it is based on a published literature that you have have been uh, published in a very good journal, a very good peer review journal, uh, it will be it will make the policy review even more um, uh, credible. Or um, then the researchers would know that it it has been accepted by uh, the wide uh, in the experts in this field. So I, I would absolutely recommend that you mention that. And in, and nowadays we have in on the online era, now we have the internet and we can share hyperlink to some research as well. So take this opportunity to use your if you are sharing in an in an online platform or sharing through emails, you can always use some hyperlink or or, or recommended like uh, links. To to some other research relevant work um, uh, um, through that. So yeah, that's what I, I think that it would be something to do. And of course, re references, referencing to your, like referring to your uh, relevant research would be absolutely, or key research would be absolutely useful. Thank you. All right, uh, once again, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Shafiq, for all this uh, quite informing and the insightful as well. We have learned a lot. Uh, that's why such kind of interactions are important. And I'm sure the discussion will continue in the background from all the participants that are here. But uh, as uh, we, are, we are winding up, I would like to thank all the participants for attending this second part of this workshop. And also I would like to thank all the panels that have really organized all this to happen the way it has happened.